you could not print enough money to get me to run for the highest office of this land. I mean, there's just not enough money in the world to get me to do that. That's a crazy job. Uh, James Caan, an actor, he was talking about how the reason that actors hire bodyguards and have an entourage of people around them, they, they, he, said they, he said they hire bodyguards not because they're in any danger. They're not in any danger. He said they do it so that you'll notice them because heaven forbid an actor should come into the room and you not take notice of that actor that some important person is here. We end up in America spending all of our time focusing on people we probably shouldn't focus on at all. It's weird, but we do it. And, uh, and uh, other people who do incredible things don't get any attention or virtually any. In 2005, on December 15th, a man caught a baby thrown from a, a burning New York building in Bronx, New York. Uh, a man made the catch of a lifetime after a woman threw a three-week-old baby out the window of a burning apartment in, in Bronx one early one morning. A fire broke out in the kitchen on a third-floor uh, third uh, apartment shortly after 8 a.m., leaving the mother and baby trapped by a window. The mother screamed out of the window for help. Felix Vasquez, the father of three maintenance worker in New York City who plays catcher for the company baseball team, didn't know what the woman was holding out the window until after she uh, let the newborn baby drop, Vasquez caught the soot-covered baby like a football, blew air into his lungs to get him breathing again. Firefighters were able to rescue the mother, and now both are doing fine. Now, that's a guy that might need some attention and recognition rather than the actors and the politicians that end up somehow monopolizing our time and attentiveness. We're going to look tonight at, at Isaiah chapter 43. It's one of the oracles that we've been digging into and finding out the ancient truth that we can apply to our present times. And that ancient truth that you're going to find that we look at tonight is God is introducing us to his servant, and that servant is Jesus. That servant also is the nation of Israel, and that servant in modern times, modern application, is you and I. We are the servant of God. And, and the point of Isaiah chapter 42 is God helps his servants. God helps Jesus in his earthly ministry. God helps Israel in their, in their wilderness wanderings and really all the way through the history of Israel. And also God helps us. In fact, God helps his servant Jesus in verses 1 through 13. Matthew applies these verses. I'll read these first verses uh, down through verse 4. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. And if you, if you were to go to Matthew chapter 12, you would find Matthew paraphrases this passage and makes application to it of Jesus and his earthly ministry. This is very messianic, this Isaiah chapter 42. is. In fact, this whole section is very messianic. It points to Jesus. The Old Testament really has types and shadows that point to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the New Testament is the revelation of Jesus Christ, so that you, you come to know him in a full uh, orbed manner in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was pointing to him, and now you see him in, in a powerful way. And so these first verses, the first 13, is God helping his servant Jesus, who is one that you can be very thankful for. In fact, it starts out in this passage, it talks about him... Uh, not crushing a bruised reed. Probably has to do with an idea of uh, Isaiah, maybe if you want to picture him writing uh, on these scrolls that are here, using sort of the bulrushes or the reeds that are there as kind of a, an ink pen, if you will. And what they would do is they would use it until, until it became so saturated with the ink that when you would push on it, it would collapse or it would break. And typically what you would do is you'd just crumple it up and throw it away. It was almost like a disposable pen of the day. And, and so the idea was, if it was, once it was broken or bruised, it was very easy to crumple it up and throw it away. But God, in Isaiah's mind, God doesn't do that. The servant doesn't crumple it up and throw it away, doesn't discard it, but instead cares about that. And it really deals with this idea of smoking flax. You know, it's, it's this idea of when the fire's kind of gone out. When your life has been bruised, God cares about you. And God steps into that bruised area in your life. When, when you're a believer, maybe you've been a believer for a long time, and somehow through the, the realities of life and the hard days that come, you're being doused by the water of this world and your fire's gone out, 
The good news is the servant of God wants to reach down and use you and reignite that fire in your life. That's a wonderful ministry of Messiah, and the servant of God does it. And so he helps his servant, Jesus Christ, who in turn does a work in our life. And then God helps Israel. And I won't read it, but that's in 14 through 25, about how God helped them, uh, was going to return the nation to their land after years of captivity. They were spiritually blind and obstinate, but God would lead them and work on their behalf. And then at the end of this, we're going to look at God helping his servants today, the application of Isaiah 42 to us. But let's look at how God chooses his servant and how you can identify the servant of God and who that servant is. In verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. Matthew 12, verse 17, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment unto the Gentiles. Number one, the servant of God is chosen by God and cherished by God. You find that here in this passage about he was chosen by God. E elect is the word used in for Isaiah 42.1. Uh, chosen is what's uh, talked about in Matthew as Matthew paraphrases this. God the Father was well pleased with his servant Jesus, with his son Jesus. I remember reading about a little guy, Johnny. He came up to his teacher and, and he kind of, he tapped her on the shoulder and he said, he said, teacher, I don't want you to be frightened or anything, but my dad says if my grades don't pick up, somebody's going to get a spanking. I'm thinking his dad wasn't too happy with little Johnny. God the Father was always pleased with Jesus. Always, every time, pleased exactly with what Jesus did. He was chosen by God, cherished by God, God's only begotten Son. Jesus was God's chosen one. God come in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. God couldn't have been more pleased with him. You and I need to know that God chose Jesus to do the ministry of salvation for us and really the fulfillment of sanctification, helping us to grow into all that we need to be as a result of the ministry of Messiah. No son ever did better than the Messiah, Jesus, the servant of God. God helped him. He was chosen. He was cherished. He was indwelt by the Spirit of God in verse, verse 1 of Isaiah 42. I have put my spirit upon him. I will, I will put my spirit upon him. The Spirit of God is probably one of the most important concepts within Christianity. It distinguishes us from just a ritualistic religious enclave. I mean, it's something that, that where the Holy Spirit, God Himself, indwells us. In the Old Testament, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, he, he was amazed. Would God, in very deed, the God of the universe, would He dwell in this temple? Would He live here? Would that be His address? where His glory would be manifested, how much more should we be stunned that God would choose to indwell us or live inside of us as believers, and yet we're assured from Acts chapter 2 uh, and really all the way through the, the rest of the New Testament that that's exactly what happened, is that we become indwelt, baptized, filled with His Holy Spirit, and that enables us to do much more than we could ever do on our own. It, it encourages us, it infills us, He educates us, He inspires us, He enables us to accomplish ministry, to live life. Uh, one committee had been sent out to determine how to put together a citywide revival, and they were looking for an evangelist to get to, in order to fulfill the meeting that would be able to, to really have an impact on their community. And one of the suggestions that was made was Dwight L. Moody. Perhaps he could come and be the evangelist that would preach this series of meetings. And it was a very favorable suggestion. There was one younger guy who was kind of full of himself and maybe thought that he should have been picked, I guess. But he said, Why? Moody, Moody, Moody. You know, he said, he said, Dwight L. Moody doesn't have a corner on the Holy Spirit. And somebody else said, yes, but the Holy Spirit has a corner on Dwight L. Moody. And that's what God wants. He wants to have a corner on me. He wants to indwell me and empower me to be, to be such a part of my life that it's, it's noticeable to everybody that's around. That's what the servant was indwelt by the Spirit. That's how we know it's a ministry of Messiah. He was completely empowered by the Spirit of God. And, and uh, A.W. Tozer, he said this about the church of his day. How much more would he say it about our day? He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. That's tragic. 
And that, that is a tragic statement. And why it's tragic is I tend to agree with it. I, I think that a lot of what goes on in the average church would continue on and a lot of people wouldn't notice the difference. How sad is that? I think that we need to become reintroduced to the Holy Spirit of God in a powerful and poignant way that He might have an impact in our, in our modern experience, in our day-to-day lives, in an infilling kind of a way. So God's servant was chosen and cherished by God. God's servant was indwelt by the Spirit of God. God's servant was a justice proclaimer. In chapter 12 of Matthew, it says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall sow judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall there any man hear his voice in the streets. When I was a little kid, I, I loved Superman. Superman was all about fighting for justice wherever he went. I, Lone Ranger was another one of my heroes. I loved the Lone Ranger riding on the white horse. Now, the one advantage of the Lone Ranger over Superman is you always knew exactly who the bad guy was in the Lone Ranger because always wore black hats. You, know, you had the white hats, you had the black hats. The bad guys always had the black hats on. And, uh, and inevitably, also, you always knew the Lone Ranger is that Tonto is going to get into some kind of horrible trouble and the Lone Ranger is going to have to rescue Tonto. I, if the Lone Ranger, if you're Tonto and the Lone Ranger sends you to do something, you need to tell him to do it himself. Because you always get in trouble whenever he sends you to go ride and send a message to somebody that you're going to go, you're going to go down through the valley where the bad guys are up on top of it and they're going to capture you. And then the Lone Ranger is going to have to ride in and hi ho silver and you know and take care and save the day reason we love those kind of characters, whether it's Superman, the, the man from Krypton, or it's the Lone Ranger, is we want justice done. We do. There's not a one of us that's not watched you know, a news unfold uh, around us about somebody that was obviously guilty that got off, and, and, and you thought, where is the justice? You know, where, where is it, in what world is this made right? Well, in what world this is made right is when Jesus comes back the second time. He's that bringer of judgment to the Gentiles and really to everybody. It's what he, what he uses the Gentiles is it's representative of the whole entirety of the planet, not just in Israel, not just in Jerusalem or Judea or or that area, but it was everywhere. Isaiah was talking about how God's judgment was going to be everywhere and Jesus would be the one who would be a part of it. That servant would be a justice proclaimer. That's a powerful thought that we, we need justice. We need that made right. A builder of broken hearts. A bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Um, boy, we need... Uh, he has a purpose in his life. There's a purpose in what he was doing, the, the, the ministry of Messiah. Jesus didn't come um, just to have a the triumphal entry. Uh, you know, the triumphal entry was an amazing thing, but that wasn't, that wasn't why he came. He, he, the, the Bible says that the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus always had his purpose in mind as he lived his life. Uh, I was I was reading about a, was one of the old talk shows, and a guy got on the talk show and he was a bodybuilder and he got on and he flexed and showed everybody his muscles. The crowd, oh, wonderful, wonderful, wow! And the the host of the show said, "What do you use those muscles for?" And he you know flexed again and did all the poses and then, wow, they went wild again. And then the third time he asked him again, "What do you use those muscles for?" And he he was go- pressing for an answer. He doesn't have any answer. He doesn't use them for anything. They're just for show. How sad is that? I wonder, I wonder if that maybe is sometimes true of our life, that sometimes our life is just for show. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a real thing that we need to think about. The, the ministry of Messiah was that he was going to come in, he would be a proclaimer of justice, he would be somebody that showed empathy on those that needed empathy where he wouldn't, he wouldn't cast away that bruised reed, he wouldn't quench or put out that smoking flax, instead he would take care of it, he would make a place of usefulness for it. The ministry of Messiah was very specific and he was about accomplishing that purpose. The question for us is, are we living our purpose that God has for our life? Are we fulfilling the role, roles and goals that God has given us as a father, as a mom, as a, as, as a, as a, 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 a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus? Are we being all that we can be in order to be pleasing to God the Father? He was a proclaimer of justice, a builder of broken hearts. Um, it, I like what one pastor said. 
we're suffering from only one disease in the world. Our basic problem is not a race problem. Our basic problem is not a poverty problem. Our basic problem is not a war problem. Our basic problem is a heart problem. We need to get the heart changed, the heart transformed. That's the reality. I mean, we, we look at the wars that's going on over in Gaza and Israel right now. We look at what's going on in the United States that we talked about earlier. And all of that goes back to a problem right here, inside my rib cage. Not just something that's out there, it's something that's inside me. And unless I fix it's inside me, the other stuff won't ever get any better. It simply cannot unless I fix my heart problem. And that heart problem is a sin problem, and those hearts are often hurting hearts. And they desperately need Messiah to come in and do a transforming work uh, and do that work that he talked about with the, the bruised reed and the smoking flax. God, is, Jesus is not going to snuff out that wick or that fire. Jesus is not going to cast away that reed. Jesus wants to come in and to do a regenerative, restorative work in, in, in our lives. Um, so, some uh, Bill, Billy Apple or Harold Applewhite, he restores cars. He will take a car that some, you know, some farmer has left in a field and, you know, and just not, not taken any care of. It looks like just a, a bucket of rust and bolts, and he will rebuild it from the frame up into something that's done. And you've seen some of the cars that he's brought here to church. They're magnificent when he's done with them. I mean, he, he makes them shine, and he makes the motor brand new. He makes it a fascinating piece of machinery. That's what Jesus wants to do with us. He doesn't look at us and go, oh, you're trash, I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to throw you away. Instead, he does that restorative work where he begins to rebuild and reshape things and make us into something that nobody could have ever imagined as a result of the heart work that is. He's a builder of broken hearts, a proclaimer of justice, a producer of hope in, in Matthew 12:21, And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. In one of the Peanuts cartoons, Lucy, Lucy and Linus are watching TV. I love Charles Schultz. His character, Lucy, is probably one of the richest characters that he ever wrote about. Lucy is watching TV and she says, Linus, go get me a glass of water. And Linus looks at her and says, why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. And she looked at him and thought for a minute. And she said, when you're 75 years old, I'm going to bake a birthday cake for you. Linus gets up and he walks into the other room and he goes, you know, a person can do a lot when they've got hope in their life. We, we, need, we need hope. There's none of us that don't need hope. We absolutely need it. And Jesus is the one that produces hope within us. You and I, as we look around us, as we see the world around us, it's easy to become very discouraged and feel very hopeless. Who hasn't said words like, I really don't want to go to work today. I, I don't want to deal with that. I, don't, I just hate to face so-and-so. I don't have the money to pay this bill. I don't know what to do about it. I mean, you kind of go on and on. And there's all these things around us that drain hope from us. We need a source of hope and we won't find it around us. We can only find it above us. We can only find it pouring down from God to us. It's got to be a supernatural source of hope that comes from outside of the broken system in which we live. The broken system it, it won't fix us. And that's the mistake that we make is we look for things around us to make us better. And the, the person, the places, and the things, the nouns around us, they cannot make us better. Only God can make us better. Uh, Barclay wrote this. He said, the Christian hope is the hope which has seen everything, endured everything, and is still not despaired because it believes in God. The Christian hope is not the hope in the human spirit, not in human goodness, not in human endurance or in human achievement. The Christian hope is in the power of God. Uh, one of the uh, minor prophets would say, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, I'm the one that brings that hope to you. Romans 8, if you get to the latter part of that chapter, it's about a hope that comes from God. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because if we already see it, if we already have it, why do we hope for it? He's talking about something that's beyond this that we can look forward to that God is going to do. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And then Paul will go on in Hebrews and make a stunning argument about the incredible things that this hope or faith produces in our life, about how this hope-filled faith framed the world. This hope-filled faith caused Abraham to seek a city that, that, whose builder and maker was God. This hope-filled faith went on and on and moved in the key individuals in all of the Old Testament 
that this hope-filled faith that they had enabled them to handle incredibly hard things that were in their life. Do you have incredibly hard things in your life? Absolutely you do. You've got children that make you weep at night. You have, you, you have situations unfolding around you that hurt your heart. News, from, news that troubles you and worries you about your future. In those instances, we must turn to the hope of God as God begins to do His incredible work in our life. Here's the, the last part of how, the, sort of the so what of Isaiah 42, this oracle. God helps not only the servant Jesus in verses 1 through 13, not only does God help his servant Israel in their national dealings and bringing them back into the land of promise, but God helps his servants today. That's you and me. And here's three ways we're specifically going to look at that God helps us. First of all, he helps us in that God can do new things. Listen to verse 9 of Isaiah 42. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God can do a brand new thing. Have you ever, have you ever gone through a time in your life when everything seemed like it was same old, same old, same old? You know, and and you, it felt like you were fighting the same battles, that you had the same resources, that you were doing the same things, and it just felt repetitive, it felt redundant it began to feel almost pointless because of the redundancy that was, that was uh, unfolding in your life. And it began to d- cause you to despair and give up and kind of almost unplug from it. But God is saying to His servant today, I'm going to do a new thing. Now the new thing I think has two applications. And one is this. Sometimes the new thing is not a new thing out there. Sometimes it's a new thing in here. Do you know, understand what I mean? In other words, sometimes... Sometimes God has to do something new inside my spirit so that I can face the same situations and challenges, but I face it with a renewed spirit, with a renewed understanding, and I see it differently than I did before. So that I, I re-sign up instead of resign. I re-sign up to, for more. And, and so, because He's done a new thing inside of me, and sometimes just a little bit different, seeing it differently makes it kind of brand new where you see it through a new pair of eyes. Now the other new thing though is that sometimes God does a new thing where He puts you in a totally different circumstance, totally different place, totally different people, where maybe He moves you and God reserves the right to do that and He does that sometimes, where He changes the outer circumstance that you're facing, He does a new thing. And then our problem is not so much a same old, same old, then we're really scared because we're in a new thing. Whenever, whenever I would move from one job to another, my stomach would always be upset the day I got the new job. I mean, I, I looked pretty calm outside, but inside I was, I was stressed out because it was something brand new and I didn't know how to do it. Would I have to use a computer that I didn't know how to do? What would it be like? What would my boss be like? What would my new people be like? But then once I got in there and I was facing the new thing, there was an excitement of learning something brand new and it was fresh in So God can do brand new things either within me or renewing me or putting me in a new situation. A second thing that God can do to help His servants today is He can guide you on new paths. In verse 16, And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. God will guide us down new pathways. Sometimes we get in, we honestly, because of our own flesh, just get into a rut. Nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with what God wants for us. Sometimes we're just not looking for what God is trying to do or we've blinded ourselves. And what God is saying here to His servants today, to you and I, is He's going to open my eyes to see new pathways that He wants me to go down, new things He wants me to try, new challenges He wants me to accept, And when I do that, God is going to empower that and He'll guide me. And He's talking here about guiding individuals that just can't see. Sometimes we can't see how it's going to work out. We can't see how it will unfold and yet God does see exactly that. So He'll do a new thing, either renewing me or giving me a new situation. He'll open our eyes to the paths that are around us that we didn't even see or know that were there. And then a third thing that He helps the servants with this is He's going to give you a new song. Sing unto the Lord a new song and His praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Vance Havner, one of my favorite preachers. If you ever get a chance to listen to a sermon by Vance Havner, listen to it. If you look, search him out on the internet. He's got some of some of his sermons are online. He is a tremendous preacher. He's the he's the preacher's preacher. You, you, there are other people that kind of the masses love. 
Vance Habner, if you're, you're a preacher, you love real preaching, he's the guy for you. He's, he's passed away now. I used to listen to tapes and tapes of him uh, when, when I would do custodial work. I could listen to a tape and sweep a floor at the same time. Vance Habner, one of his, uh, one of his sermons was about a new song. And he talked about how uh, the, after the death of his wife, he'd been married to her for over 60 years, and when she died, he lost his song. And he talks about it in this sermon. He talks about after she died, he developed insomnia. He couldn't sleep at night. I mean, he'd lay there and just his eyes were wide open. There was no, sleep wouldn't come to him. And, and he, he talked about uh, one of the passages here. It was either in Psalms or Isaiah. I can't remember. But he talks about this idea of a new song. And, and he prayed. He got with God and prayed that God would give him a new song. And God did give him a new song, and he, he, he became able to sleep at night, and God began to heal that hurt that was in his heart. You know, sometimes as, as life goes along, you lose your song. You I mean, some things happen that are, that are devastating, that they're tumultuous. They're sort of like a, an emotional tsunami, a, a, a hurricane of pain that just sweeps through your life and blows everything over, and you begin to feel like, I, I can't get up. I, I, you've lost your song. What God wants to do is, is that old song... He wants to put a new song in its place, a new song that, that even incorporates some of those difficult things that are going through. The piano over here, it, it's got the, the white notes, the, the, the notes that are like the, you know, the major stuff, and then it's got the, these black notes, and the black notes are those, you know, the sharps and the flats, those kind of things that are, that, that are a part of the, you know, the, the, almost the counter melody of it. And, God, God wants to compose a song in my life that not only, it, not just the good things, not just the, the bright, shiny, wonderful things, but he wants a new song in my heart and my life that has the white keys and the black keys, the light colors and the dark colors, something that is, that is truly representative of what real life is like. And so sometimes when we lose our old song, that new song that God gives us is infinitely better because it's more real. It's a joy that's more real because it's based on real life, not based on just the, just the good days, but it's based on the good and the bad. And God, it's God stepping in and doing something supernatural where when I've lost my song, He gives me a brand new song. I'm going to close out with this thought. We're set not to preach sociology but salvation, not economics but evangelism, not reform but redemption, not culture but conversion, not progress but pardon, not social order but new birth, not organization but a new creation, not democracy but the gospel, not civilization but Christ. We have a message of hope because it comes from outside of the system. If, if you look for the system to make things better, you will always 100 percent of the time be disappointed but our hope comes from God and God helps his servants today live in these last days with hope from on high let's stand and, and close our time together here in prayer mighty Jesus I do thank you for allowing us to have this oracle God it's an oracle we need we need to become better acquainted with your servant Jesus that we might be better servants in these last days Help us to emulate what he did and what he said, that we might be a better Christians, that we might really represent what, what a Christian is in these last days, that others that look at us would have no trouble defining the word because they would think of us when they think of that word Christian. God, I just thank you for the encouragement that's here. Lord, I pray to be with those that maybe have lost their song. God, I, I know that very real struggles happen to Christians. Just because we know you doesn't mean we don't experience bad things. Help us, God, to get that new song that you want to put into us and allow that new song to be something that is so vibrant that has a very healing properties in every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving.